We begin a new series today. If your life looks like some of the apparatus on this platform, discarded pieces of forgotten junk, if you look around wondering, what in the world will I ever use this for? What is the purpose of this problem I'm going through? If you can relate, then boy, do I have a person I want you to meet. His name is Joseph. His story occupies more chapters in the book of Genesis than any other Bible character. And though he lived 3,600 years ago, I know that's a long time, 1,600 years prior to the life of Jesus Christ, though he lived in a distant land on the other side of the globe, his story is being rewritten every day on every street in our society. And I think you're going to find hope in his story. Under the theme, you'll get through this. Open your Bibles if you brought them to Genesis chapter 37. If you like to take notes, there's an outline available with some spaces to be filled in. Or if you'd rather just sit back and receive it, then that's your choice. Let's offer a prayer and then we'll get to work. Heavenly Father, would you please have mercy upon the one who speaks? For his sins are many. Please. Help us to see Jesus in the life of Joseph and him only. Through Christ we pray. And all God's people said. She had a tremble to her. That kind of inner tremble you can feel with just a hand on the shoulder. I saw her in a grocery store. Not far from here, in fact. I hadn't seen her in quite some months. I asked her about her kids and her husband. And when I did, the story began to spill out. She tried to maintain her composure, but she couldn't. Chin began to quiver, eyes began to moisten. After 20 years of marriage, a dozen moves, and three kids, he decided that he wanted a younger woman and was trading her in. Right there between the tomatoes and the heads of lettuce, she began to weep. And we began to pray. And after the prayer, here's what I said to her. I said, you'll get through this. It won't be painless. And it won't be quick. But God has a way of taking these messes and using them for something good. In the meantime, don't be foolish. And don't be naive. But don't despair either. With God's help, you'll get through this. Not long after that, I received a phone call from a friend. He was despondent. 57 years old, he had just been fired from his job. This is not a good era, not a good time in which to lose a job. Especially if you're 57 years old. But it was his fault. Sometimes he doesn't watch his tongue, his words. He said some things, just kind of inappropriate, tacky remarks, not correct, not the right thing to say in a workforce. And his manager really didn't have a choice. He had to let him go. And he wasn't mad at the manager, this guy. He was really mad at himself, and his wife was utterly disappointed. And I said, what you did was not right. But you know what? You'll get through this. It won't be painless. And it may not be quick. But God has a way of taking these messes and turning them into something good. In the meantime, don't be naive and don't be foolish. But don't despair either. With God's help, you'll get through this. Who am I to make such promises? Where do I get off offering such words of hope? Where did I find these kind of statements? Actually, I found them in a pit of all places. A pit. And if you like to fill in blanks, there's your cue. <laughs> Our story starts in a pit. Consider these. 
Really, some of the harshest and coldest words in the whole Bible, they're found in the book of Genesis, chapter 37. And so it came to pass, when Joseph had come to his brothers, that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him where? Into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. It's an abandoned cistern out in the middle of the desert. Jagged rocks and roots extend from the side. And this 17-year-old boy lies at the bottom. His name is Joseph. And he looks just like a boy with the spinely arms and legs and the downy beard. His hands are bound, his ankles are tied, and he lies on his side, his knees to his chest, cramped in the small space. His eyes are wide with fear, his voice is hoarse from screaming. It's not that his brothers do not hear him, mind you. In fact, 20 years from now, his brothers will remember this moment, and here will be their confession. We saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. The brothers put him here. These are the sons of Jacob. These are ten of the twelve great-grandsons of Abraham. These are the men after whom the tribes of Israel will be named. These are men whose names are in the Bible for crying out loud. In the book of Revelation, they're described as the ones whose names appear on the foundation of the city of Jerusalem in the new heaven. But today, here in Genesis 37, 1600 B.C., they are the Bronze Age version of a dysfunctional family. Twelve in all. Number 12 is back home. Number 11 is in the pit. And the other ten, what are they doing? They're eating lunch. Eating lunch. Hearts as hard as the Canaanite desert. How can you eat at a time like this? Here's how. They hate this boy. They hate him. They hated him and they could not speak peaceably to him. If hate were gold, this is Fort Knox. These guys are bitter. They're angry. They spit bitterness. They hate him. You see, Joseph is daddy's favorite. Joseph is daddy's boy. The other brothers, they get bunk beds. Joseph gets his own room. The other brothers, they ride bikes. Joseph gets his own car. He was the first one to get an iPhone. The other brothers wear hand-me-downs. He gets, Joseph gets this classy, tailor-made, multicolored suit that his father Jacob had made personally just for him. And Joseph wears it around. Many think this was the symbol of the firstborn son, as if to say Joseph had leapfrogged his way in the first place in the eyes of his father. It's a difficult situation. But today, they were going to put it to an end. You see, right now, they're 50 miles away from Jacob. 50 miles. They're out tending the herd. Joseph has been sent by Jacob to tell them something. And when they see him, they see their chance. And they strip the tunic. They throw him into the pit. Had it not been for the intervention of the oldest brother, Reuben, they would have killed him. They would have turned that pit into a grave. And Joseph would have been a cadaver. But here's how a story starts in a pit. I'm wondering if I'm talking to anybody whose life can be described in the same phrase. You feel like life is the pits. Have you ever noticed one characteristic of a pit is that you never see it coming? I don't think that when Joseph woke up that morning, he thought, okay, today is the day I get dumped in the pit. I better wear padded clothes. I don't think that he thought... This was going to happen. Can I give you a characteristic of a pit? It's an unexpected tumble. Disasters don't call ahead. Calamities do not serve advance notice. You're walking along the sidewalk of life and somebody yanks back the manhole cover and down you go. 
layoffs, cancer. She cheated on me. He turned from me. Of course, it's one thing to land in a pit because of the bad weather or the bad economy. But let me tell you, folks, it's something else entirely, isn't it? To land in the pit because of people who are supposed to love you, care for you. I think that's another characteristic of the pit. Not only is it an unexpected trouble, it's unfair treatment. That's a mark of the pit. Unfair treatment. We have a word for this, abandonment. And we live in a culture that sees marks of abandonment on every corner. Fathers who don't take care of their kids. Mothers who don't love the husband. There's a sense of abandonment from responsibility. A sense of walking away. Maybe you were not thrown in a pit, but maybe you were thrown in a bed and molested. Maybe you were thrown in a gang and beaten. Maybe you were thrown in a school or on a corner and neglected abandonment if so you know the pain of unfair treatment and if so you know this third characteristic of the pit and that is you have an uncharted future who knows what the future holds you see if my brothers will do this anything could happen we crossed a line here anything could happen Unexpected trouble, unfair treatment, uncharted future. Joseph's life is the pits. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember a TV show called Hee Haw. <laughs> but there was a line in it that was sung in every song that had this verse. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd... You're a lot older than I thought you were. <laughs> That describes Joseph's life, doesn't it? If it weren't for bad luck, he'd have no luck at all. And let me tell you, as we unpack the story of Joseph over the next four months, you're going to see that this day in the pit was, pit was a picnic compared to what awaited him. Shackles, prison, betrayal, promises made, promises broken. He did the right thing only to be punished for something he did not do. But you know what's remarkable about Joseph? He never gave up. He never got bitter. He never let his heart get sour or hard. Somehow he kept believing. And we read the story of Joseph and we scratch our head and we say, now how did he do that? And did you know he tells us? To make sure we know what he knew and how he endured, he tells us. We have to go all the way to the end of his story to find the statement. But at the risk of giving away the ending, I'm going to take you to that statement. It's in the last chapter of his story. I like to call it, if you want to fill in the blank, the 50-20 principle. Because it's Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. Genesis 50 in verse 20 and it reads like this as for you you meant evil against me but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive Joseph had no way of knowing that day in the pit that God was going to take him to Egypt where he would be elevated to be the prince of Egypt and thereby, therefore oversee Society during a time of great famine and literally saved the lives of millions of people. He didn't know that. But what he says to his brothers is this. What you meant for evil, God meant for good in order to bring about this present result. Now I'll tell you, that's a wonderful phrase in English, but you know the Old Testament was written originally in the language of Hebrew and the listeners to Joseph would have picked up on what Joseph is doing here in his wordplay. He says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. The word meant appears twice and it comes from a Hebrew word which means to weave, to weave. What you wove as evil, God rewove for good. It's the picture of God as the master weaver sitting there at the loom of history, 
weaving together centuries and societies and lives, details and dates, every event of history being woven together to create a tapestry that you and I cannot see yet, but will see someday. And Joseph says, when evil comes, God can take that evil and he can reweave it into something that turns out good. Now, maybe you don't connect with the picture of the master weaver. Then try this picture. It's also in Genesis 50, 20. And that's the picture of the master builder. The phrase, God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result. That phrase, bring about, that comes from a phrase which means to build or to construct Here's the picture of God walking onto the vacant lot where there's nothing but iron and lumber and semen all stacked around. And someone says, can anything good come out of this? And God, the master builder, comes in with a design and a blueprint and he begins stacking this with that and that with this. You look at your life which seems so full of chaos and you wonder, can anything good come out of this? My parents didn't care for me. My job isn't good. The situation is worth Now my doctor says this. And God comes in with a blueprint and says, well, I can take this and I can match it with that and I can work this. Joseph looked back on his life, ladies and gentlemen, and he said, I see the master weaver. I see the master builder. I see a lot of evil, but I see how God could take it all and turn it into something good. Again, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. You see, in God's hands, the pit becomes the palace. The torn robe becomes the royal robe. And the disbanded, rebellious family becomes the family that grows old together in God's hands. So my question to you, do you see God as a master weaver? Do you see God as a master builder? If not, then I understand where your anxiety is coming from. You think it's up to you. You think you're the one who has to fix everything. You see, if your view of God is small, then your view of problems is great. But if your view of God is great, even the greatest problem seems small. What Joseph teaches us is have the right view of God. The master weaver, the master builder God. And through Joseph, we get this promise. Here it is. You'll get through this. You will. Our God is a God who gets people through things. He got the Israelites through the Red Sea on dry ground. He got them through the wilderness after 40 years of wandering. He is the God, according to Psalms 23, who walks us through the valley of the shadow of death. According to Psalm 77, He walks us through the deep sea. And we cherish this promise in Isaiah 43. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Folks, here it is. God will get you through this. God will get you through this. He will. I know we fear that He won't, but the Scriptures teach us that God is a God of deliverance. He delivered Daniel from the lion's den, Peter from the prison, Joni from the whale's belly, David from Goliath's shadow. He will get you through this. When? I don't know. I know this. It won't be painless. Have you wept your last tear? Have you, have, you, have you faced your last sleepless night? I hope so, but I can't promise that. But I can promise this, that God will use this pain for His purpose. And it may not be quick. Joseph is 17 years old here in the pit. You know he's going to be 37 before he sees his brothers again. 20 long years. Sometimes God takes his time. It took him 180 years to get, 120 years to get Noah ready, 80 years to get Moses ready. 
Took him 14 years to get Paul the apostle ready. He called David to be a king and sent him back out to the pasture. He wasn't quite ready yet. And even Jesus Christ was on this earth for three decades, 30 years, before, as far as we know, he built anything besides a kitchen table and a chair. Sometimes God takes his time. Maybe he'll fix you in just one day. Of course, the Bible says with God, one day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years like one day. God does not measure his, listen, God does not measure his work in minutes, but in lifetimes. He will get you through this. It won't be painless. It may not be quick, but I tell you what, God can use this mess for good if you let him. We see family dysfunction. God saw Joseph in the making. We see a pit. God saw an opportunity to train Joseph. We see a perfect mess. God saw a perfect chance to train and teach and prepare the future prime minister of Egypt. God sees what we do not. But listen, we must cooperate with him. The New Testament version of Genesis 50, 20 is this, Romans 8, 28. We know that all that happens to us is working for our good if we love God and are fitting into His plans. You see, during a time of crisis, listen, during a time of crisis, you are a sitting duck for a stupid decision. Addictions, anger, Broken hearts, distant relationships, torn families, they all trace their root back to times of crisis. A crisis can be a greenhouse in which faith flourishes, but it can also be a petri dish in which bad habits and bad decisions grow. That's why I urge you, don't be foolish. Don't be naive. But don't despair either. This is no time for despair. You will get through this. Listen, you just need the right view of God. How you see Him determines how you see your problems. You don't need a change of circumstances. I know you think you do. And that's always what I want. I want God to change the circumstances. And sometimes God does, but more typically, God instead of changing our circumstances, changes us in the midst of our circumstances. And He uses our circumstances to change us. So here's where we start. God is our master weaver. God is our master builder. He is at work doing things that we cannot see. Behind our life, the weaver stands and works His wondrous will we leave it all in His wise hands and trust His perfect will. Should mystery enshroud His plan and our short sight be dim, we will not try the whole to scan, but leave each thread to Him. I invite you to join with me over the next four months as we walk chapter by chapter through the story of Joseph and see the handiwork of God. I'd like to invite you to affirm with me this promise of Joseph's life. What I told the people that I told you about at the outset of the message, I'd like you to say, not just today, but every time we open these pages, and not just every time we open these pages, but every day over the next few months. Would you like to affirm your faith in God as Master Weaver? If so, stand up, please. Fill your lungs with air. And let God fill your heart with hope. The words will appear on the screen. Say them aloud with me. I'll get through this. It won't be painless. It won't be quick. But God will use this mess for good. I won't be foolish or naive. But nor will I despair. With God's help, I know I will get through this. Heavenly Father. This is our declaration of faith. This is our resolve. But Father, we have learned that today's resolve can melt in the heat of tomorrow's sun and scorn. 
So we ask you, Father, to hold us now, to steady our faith, to stabilize our feet, and help us to take just one step at a time. Father, with your help, we'll get through this. And we invite you to take this mess and use it for good, for your glory and our development. We trust you, Lord, to work in the right way at the right time. Through Jesus, we offer this prayer. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.